Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Map Round Show, this time live with audio. <laughs> so if you are on the old streams, bin that one, had a little technical glitch. Uh, but nonetheless, we are live officially, so welcome uh, Tom Hunt, all the way from London, dude. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, we're going to get into all things B2B marketing, podcasting, so a lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, are very into podcasts, very different to five years ago. Um, and uh, I get asked a lot, should I start a podcast, all this kind of stuff. And so um, we're going to get into a whole bunch of um, great content for you guys. So uh, before we get into the, the weeds, though, uh, Tom, why don't you give our viewers uh, around the world a bit of the elevator pitch? Um, tell us a bit about yourself, um, you know, and, uh, and kind of what's your background and that kind of stuff. Hit us off. Yeah, so my background, I... I studied chemistry at uni and then I did management consulting for four years and neither of those things like really excited me. And so what happened in 2014 is that I set myself the goal of leaving my consulting job by building a business on the side that would replace the income. And I managed to do that. And so I left the start of 2015 and then really since then, I've just been selling things on the internet. That's Sell how I describe it. Selling things on the internet. What kind of things? Oh God. <laughs> so we can go through the list. Should we go through the list? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. So we'll we'll try and make them like least exciting to most exciting. So probably the least exciting thing. It might be now, right? I sell like podcast services and software. It's pretty pretty low like low in terms of excitement. Uh, moving up that list, I think male leggings. We had a male leggings brand. That was a bit more exciting. Um, moving up that list again, though this is a boring one. Uh, selling like locksmith services in like America, like Google AdWords arbitrage. Next, we have like a subscription Tinder, like dating service. Sold that online. Um, see if I can top this off with the most exciting one. I might have burnt myself out. I think the leggings, <laughs> the leggings or the dating service, they're the most exciting. So which one did was probably the most successful in your, in your experience? Financially? Yeah. Uh, right now it would be the podcast service. That's been the most financially successful. And that's called what exactly? Where can the guys go and find more information on that? Fame.so, fame.sierra Oscar. Fame.sierra Oscar. Awesome. So um, podcast hosting, interesting. I've probably used a few uh, in my time. What which, kind of makes... Which ones? Uh, dude, I've, I'm on Buzzsprout now. Oh uh, my God. I know, right? Uh, I was on SoundCloud. Um, I tried self-hosting in the beginning. Yeah, wow, I mean, okay. it's uh, the, the I know, don't, rec don't recommend that to anyone ever, um, but uh, <clears throat> you live and you learn, right? So, um, so why podcast hosting? Yeah, so we, I, essentially what happened in like 2018 is that, again, I'm like trying to sell stuff on the internet. So I'm like, I'm going to build an email list in SaaS marketing. I've got seven years experience online marketing. I see like SaaS is a good trend. Like SaaS companies have a lot of money, going to be able to sell them some stuff. So I started an email list, which was a daily Monday to Friday, like email where I would just find how a SaaS company has grown. And then I would write about how they did that. So I did that for like six months, I think, built the email list only to like 4,000 people. And what I learned from doing, obviously I, I managed to sell them some stuff at the end, but what I learned was that a good way to start a SaaS company was to choose a like growing trend and then sub niche that trend and then build a solution that's just better for that smaller sub niche and then that's a, like an interesting way to like actually bootstrap a company because there's demand there maybe you can kind of use inspiration from the bigger players to like build your own so that's exactly what we did i found my co-founder by putting a ps on the bottom of one of those emails i said ps does anyone like podcasting and have experience building web apps so i found neil then me and neil build bcast which is podcast hosting software growing trend uh for a specific niche uh, for high growth businesses. So just businesses that want to grow, we have podcast hosting software for you. It's very interesting, right? Because I've also subscribed to the idea that like all boats rise with a rising tide. And oftentimes when you found companies, I found it, I don't know, too many over the last 20 years, many of those bombed, probably because, <clears throat> you know, the markets that they were based in weren't growing, you know, um, and it's, you can't grow unless that market's, you can only grow to a point. And then if you really want to scale, you got to be in a market where with either a market category defining product uh, or proposition, or you got to be in a growing market. So as long as you're selling consistently, you know you can get your MRR, or your monthly recurring revenue up to levels where you're sitting with a cool lifestyle business. 
podcast hosting sounds to me like a very competitive space. Uh, there's lots of options out there. You've got a largely uneducated market. You've got, last I heard, 2 million plus podcasts. So your TAM's not 200 million uh, podcasts. So how do you, uh, like, I'm curious, um, I know podcasting as a category is growing. I know that there are many uh, podcasts out there where there are like three episodes, <laughs> you know, because it was like a really good idea to start a podcast today uh, or last week or last month or six months ago. And then people realize that actually it's a lot of work um, and it's not, it's something that you have to, you know, sustain. Um, and many people can't figure out the ROI of a podcast commercially. Uh, so if you're, you know, paying for hosting and then you're paying for content production, then you've got to pay for equipment and then you've got to, the time to get guests. Like, you know, it's, it becomes not only a time suck, but something to, uh, that becomes, if you don't get it right, becomes something that's difficult to commercially, um, you know, generate a return on. Like even now with my show, I mean, uh, this is the seventh year we've had millions of downloads and only this year have I started making money which is crazy, right? Who does something for seven years and then doesn't make a money off it? So the thing, a question I have is, are you bullish on podcasting? Like if someone is listening to us as a founder entrepreneur and they're like, yo, Tom, Mr. Podcast Hosting Guy, do I start a podcast now or do I just go YouTube? Yeah, so our basic view is just like every business now has an RSS feed for written content, you do a blog that every business should also have an RSS feed for audio content, e.g. a podcast. And actually a good way to get onto YouTube or to have one playlist in YouTube, which you are going to be in a, which is easy to create content for for a while, would be to start a podcast, record video, rip out the audio for the RSS feed, and then put the, the YouTube video onto a playlist on your channel. Okay, fantastic. Um, talk to me a bit about your thoughts on Clubhouse versus podcast. I mean, obviously, Clubhouse was the thing. I had like a you know, bazillion invites to that, didn't accept any of them because um, I didn't need to be on an audio-based social network. Um, so are you, I mean, are you bullish on audio-based, purely audio-based social networks at the moment? I... I'm not, but not because I've done like a deep analysis. Obviously, I went on to clubhouse in COVID when everyone was going on on that but we haven't the for like client shows for fame the operational complexity that it introduces to go live on clubhouse or twitter spaces whilst the author recording the show is not worth the extra like attention we would get from being on those platforms so unless something changes to make it easier to go live on those platforms or those platforms it's easier to get attention on which i don't think either of those are going to happen we probably wouldn't change that Right, got it. Um, so one of the things I saw was that um, your both of your startups, you bootstrapped it, which, uh, which I'm a great believer in. I mean, are, would you consider taking funding and under what criteria would you look at taking funding? I'm curious to get your view being in the audio hosting space. Yeah, I think the criteria for funding would be expertise of investor, valuation and control so if we if like some absolute legend in the podcasting or online marketing game wants to invest they want to invest at a very high valuation and they're happy to not take any control then that we would probably do that right but if it's like a normal investor who wants like a, a low valuation and wants to like do stuff and control then we would say no so that it comes down to those like how much value can they add outside the money like what's the price of the thing they're buying? Can we increase the price, e.g. the valuation? And then like, are they happy to to not take any control? Yeah, I think control is a big one. Uh, I personally would like, I've, I've actually been stress testing this idea of do you take a partner? Like I'm curious about that too, because if you went PS, hey, do you, know, do you have experience in podcasting and app development so as an example, a web app space, um, I'm curious, why did you want to partner at, at all? If you were going to bootstrap it yourself, or was it a case of you didn't have a particular skill set or you, you know, didn't want to take the journey on yourself? Um, what was the reason for you taking on a partner at all? Yeah, so for Bcast, I, I don't have coding skills. So the my co-founder for Bcast has coding skills. So that was the reason. Um, I had previously built an online marketplace where I'd paid a development team in Egypt to a contract and they were great actually they were great it was very cost effective but it was so stressful um 
And so this time, well, I've started a number of other companies with co-founders, but yeah, I, I typically building a tech focused product is good to have that skill set in house. Yeah, it is. You don't want to be sitting with your development team in Egypt or the Philippines with your IP. Because <laughs> uh, exactly. if you want to, then you, I suppose it goes back to the VC thing. Because if you, if you then want to raise money, they go, well, who owns your IP? Oops. But yeah, so 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 you definitely bake, like obviously if anyone wants to do this, like you bake in the contract that you own the IP if you're paying an outsource agency. But then the big challenge is that they also, there are such high switching costs that they can pressure you with pricing and you're still not going to leave because you have to get this whole new dev team to understand the code base, mm. right? Mm. And so that was one of the challenges is that they could just jack up rates and you would still have to take it um, unless you wanted to switch, but that was costly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you look for anything else in your founder dynamics other than just skill sets? So I have never taken on a partner. I've, I've always found that... Um, uh, that I'd rather pay someone a high salary than give them equity uh, in my businesses, purely because I want control. And also, if I want to sell it, I don't have to talk to someone li like you, for instance, Tom, and go, hey, Tom, I want to sell. And you're like, no, you know, <laughs> I don't want to sell. It's not the right time. I know there's shareholder agree shareholders agreements and things like that that can cover the kind of decision-making insurance, if you like. Uh, but it's, it's, it, people are so unpredictable. If it comes, if it, when it comes to money, um, and uh, especially money, people can go into every any engagement with the right intentions. But when it comes to money, at the bottom, at the end, the people are like sharks. Like they're totally unpredictable. We are self-serving, hungry capitalists. Many of us as as founding entrepreneurs. Um, and so, I for, for me personally, I will very I'll probably never take on any VC funding or take on a partner. I'd rather bootstrap it, pay for specific skills at a high price, if that's necessary, or outsource it. And then maybe over time, bring it into your point, Tom, uh, to bring it in house. Um, but I find to be autonomous around the growth of your company and the vision that you want to establish, unless you're in pure, specifically in the tech space, if you have a founder who's a CTO, fine, difficult, uh, sorry, better, I would say, to your point. But any other business that's not specifically deep skill orientated, I wouldn't uh, recommend a founder. What are your thoughts on that or a co-founder? Yeah, right? I I agree. That's one of, one of the reasons why I don't have a founder for fame. The caveat, though, is that you can do that probably because you spent X amount of years developing the skills needed to get a company off the ground, right? So if somebody doesn't have those skills and they are going to have to learn like sales and marketing and how to build like a service or a product, then they might be like, okay, I'll just do sales and marketing. It'll take me a year and then I can find a co-founder. So I totally get it. And I, this is why I avoided a co-founder, but you still need to have the skills or if you don't have the skills, you are going to need to have the money to actually get it to work in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Can we talk about niching? Cause I think it's quite interesting because podcast hosting is an interesting niche uh, in my view or niche, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> um, but um, in this podcasting space, uh, what you talk about is something called B2B specific podcasting. Could you unpack that for us? Uh, so we're all clearing on exactly what that means in the context of podcasting. Yeah. So B2B would mean uh, you are a company that sells, you're a business and you sell to another business. And so fame, our service, you're right, is just focused on B2B companies. Now, the reason we do that is because, and you actually touched upon this earlier, and maybe I'll throw a question back to you first, Matt, before, we, yeah. before I give my answer. You mentioned you've been doing the the podcast for seven years you only started getting paid this year why would anyone do that the reason they would do that is because they're getting value in other yeah. ways than just cash right so my question Matt, is how have you received value from the show over the past seven years do you have oh, a money. podcast do you have your own podcast tom because you're you would, you ask the tough questions the very good ones um no uh, seriously i think um i i can't actually put into words how much value I've gotten outside of just the medium itself. So for instance, you know, I, like we, we, I did a lot of live shows prior to COVID, like had, you know, nine, 10, 11 sold out shows all across the country, back to back. So, okay, I wasn't making money on the medium of audio, mm. but I was making shit tons of money in eventing. And the, right. uh, and the whole banner was the podcast, right? So I could commercialize in many other channels over and above the medium. So in other words, if uh, here's my thing. If you're going to commercialize uh, a, a podcast specifically, 
you need scale and you need a lot of scale to make commercial models work like you know cost per thousand downloads or uh you know cost per conversion so it'd be like like who came who contacted us the other day it was a uh, manscape so they wanted to pay us like x fee based on the number of people that fill out the form so i was like i said to them yeah but how many form fills do you need to make this work so like you must have like Joe Rogan scale or like, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not that's too <laughs> extreme. You can do it for less, but you need, you know, a hundred thousand downloads per episode, a million downloads per episode for that to start working really in your favor because you're just making nominal cash. But um, for me and to ask, answer your question specifically, Tom, podcasting, the more I do it, the richer I get and I get richer in terms of network. So I've had neuroscientists on the show, a uh, guy literally researched why or what contributes to success. So when, perform and he said, when performance can be measured, uh, then performance most of the time drives success. But when performance cannot be measured, in other words, uh, an audio interview like this, how do you measure that? Well, through views or downloads or whatever the case is, right? But he said, so that's performance. So most people have shitty download numbers. Um, but network drives success in all other cases. So by network, if you're a founder entrepreneur, start a podcast, but don't just think about you know audio, start a YouTube channel or something, but start some channel, start somewhere. And if you can scale it, scale it to all channels everywhere. Um, but uh, it's all about these con conversations, right? So I have a network, I'm, I told you I'm moving to the States next month. So um, finally, and um, you know, I, I have a network, Steve Blank, Alexander Osterwalder, like, like the who's who of business, I can tap up purely because I had a conversation with them on this uh, medium. What is the ROI on that? You can't put a number on it because you never know what network they have that they could introduce me to that I could commercialize something else. So to answer your question, um, it's not about the medium, it's about the network. And that's exactly why we uh, focus our service on our B2B companies, because for our B2B, for like head of sales, CEO, founder, head of marketing at a B2B SaaS company, just in interacting with people that easy could be their customers, not that they're going to pitch, but they're going to learn from them. They're going to build a relationship or their partners enables people to get through that hump of having no downloads for the first three months or the first six months, because they're getting value from the show in other ways. And then you can just keep going and ultimately you, you'll get, obviously with these B2B shows that are super niche, you're not going to get hundreds of thousands of downloads, but you'll get to the thousand or 2000 or 5,000 of downloads a month. If you're consistent over six months and you make the, the episodes better every time, mm. but you can only do that if the business believes that the show is like worthwhile doing. Yeah. I love that point because there's almost like a sub niche within, you know, podcasting. So you got B2B podcasting and then within the B2B podcasting space, you've got these podcasts that are serving specific things or sub niches. So for instance, you know, Salesforce CRM, how do you, how do you scale your customer engagement through CRMs on, you know, on Salesforce or whatever. Um, and then every other kind of permeation of B2B, like Lee, how do you <laughs> generate sales qualified leads, you know, for technology customers. And there's a podcast for that. Um, and I think um, if I'm hearing you correctly, Tom, what you're saying is, is that in the B2B podcasting space, the ROI is not necessarily about the downloads, even though your system is helping them get, you know, over the hump of slow organic growth, but through the focus on specific use cases or um, problems that exist within the B2B podcasting space within a particular industry or type of business. So for instance, you know, CRMs for uh, B2Bs or businesses as an example, um, you're saying that it's actually gr a great way to do thought leadership and build relationships and network and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. All right. So what have you learned? What surprised you about this whole journey that you've been on in, in you know, B2B podcasting? Yeah, I think, I think these, for some reason, I think that people are spending more time trying to get good at their jobs. Well, it's almost like there's self-help or like learning is becoming more of a thing. Like I think 10 years ago or when my parents were like at work, they wouldn't spend their time like upskilling so they can like get a new job. 
or they wouldn't spend their time like posting on LinkedIn. And so the more that people want to get good at their job, the more opportunity there is for businesses that serve that buyer persona to like create content for them to consume so they can get better at their job. And so I think that's the, the what may have surprised me is the engagement and like consumption we get of topics in podcasts that are like really to like a normal person, not interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> like the one, the, the, the first B2B podcast I ever did was just focused on the sales operations niche. Now, anyone outside sales operations is going to think that's really boring. But now we've done 220 episodes. I think it's most downloaded is Shem Sales Ops. And it's like thousands, I think tens of thousands of people to listen to every month. Yeah. It's amazing. It's crazy, right? It's funny how now it's like people uh, are almost schooled to believe that you must be for everyone. Um, and what I've learned is that, you know, the only time scale comes is when you for someone and you say, no, we're not for you. We're for this type of customer and you must go away. Uh, but, you know, when, and then when you say I'm for you and then you pitches up, the guy pitches up or she pitches up and it, you're saying, hey, we well, specialize in your specific space. It's kind of like what you've done. In your, in your example around, um, you know, sales operations, it's the same thing, right? It's like the niche you go, like, for instance, all, what I've learned is you, if you can find one use case and you can find it in 100,000 companies, you can build a million dollar business. You don't need to be for, you don't need to have a total addressable market for a future VC raise when you've got no revenue <laughs> of like, you know, a hundred million of these companies. Like it's, it doesn't matter. You don't need to have that TAM in place to be successful. As long as you can find a niche that you can own to your point around the sales operations example is that's, that's kind of what you're, you're also saying, right? Yeah, that's exactly the our whole model. Um, that show is called sales ops demystified. I was hoping for 200 episodes, even though I didn't know anything about sales operations. Now I'm throwing all my sales operations community under the bus saying that thing is boring. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like that's his, for, for your content, well, actually you start for your business at the business level. If you can niche down sufficiently, then it's going to be much easier for you to create the content that's going to attract these people. Um, and I would also recommend that your, the content you produce, e.g. the podcast or whatever, is more niche than your business. So the example I'd love to give is, yes, yeah, so you have, you sell email marketing software. You can start a podcast on marketing. You can start a podcast on email marketing, or you can start a podcast on open rates. I would highly recommend starting the podcast on open rates because in three months, you can be the most downloaded podcast on open rates. You can say that it's going to mm. give you a bit of like press value, or whatever, but then it's always much easier. Well, and then you're also going to have built relationships with 20 open rate experts, maybe some open rate experts that give you product ideas. They come, they also come and use your product, test it out and then become customers. And it's much easier to go from the number one email, email, open rate podcast to the number one email marketing podcast over like the next one to two years. But so even if your business isn't niche enough, I would suggest you put your, your content more niche. So Tom, how long should you invest in something like a podcast for email open rates um, or whatever your niche is uh, before you should look to, to, to decide whether or not this is something uh that you should continue with because let's say that someone did that. They went with email open rates. They did it for six months. They're getting 5,000 downloads per, per episode as an example. Um, and they haven't yet figured out how to commercialize that attention. How long should they continue with that journey? Yeah. So ROI is going to come from listener side or guest side. We typically say six months. We want, to, we want to launch in month two. We want to see downloads increasing by 10% every month from month two. If that's happening, then then we're good. And if we keep that 10% month to month growth rate up, then we're, we're looking good in a couple of years. Um, but then we also have, in that short period of time, we're more likely to see signals or potential ROI from the guest side. So if it's a bi-weekly show, you've been running for five months because you launched in month two, that's going to get you 10 relationships. Yeah, And so then we're looking at out of those 10 relationships, let's say three were potential partners and seven were potential customers. Did any of these progress in sales conversations or did any of these pro progress into partnership conversations where the partner might become an affiliate of our tool? And so 
in those first six months, we probably want to see one or two of those either enter into partnership or sales conversations. If we see that and we see the download growth, then we're like confident we would keep investing. If we're not seeing download growth or that, then things need to be need to be tweaked. It's so interesting. I'm on the, the Bcast um, website at the moment. Guys, go head on over to uh, bcast.fm uh, for reference for what uh, we're going to be talking about now. I'm curious about how you drive that growth. So um, it's, I to be honest with you, to this day, podcast advertising. In other words, I want to advertise my podcast on iTunes. Can't do that to my knowledge. Um, I want to advertise my podcast, Steve with Steve Blank or whoever it might be, to entrepreneurs in a podcast distribution ecosystem like yours, or Buzzsprout, or SoundCloud, or any of the other options which um, are available to you. To this day, Tom, I don't actually know how to do that. Seven years into it, but if you ask me on YouTube how to grow my YouTube channel, even though we've only moved to YouTube like at the beginning of this year, we've got, I don't know, 17,000 subscribers now. Um, I know how to promote that shit easy. I can target that and grow that channel faster just because of my knowledge around how you, how you can market content in the B2B space on LinkedIn, YouTube, and to a lesser extent, Facebook, depending on the size of your customer. So, um, how do you promote your podcast? So I know guys who have started your podcast or started a podcast. They've got, you know, let's just say six months worth of investment, time, energy, all this kind of stuff. They're getting 10% growth kind of thing, but they want, they, they've got cash. They want to, they want to put $10,000 down on a promotional campaign. That's going to drive subscriptions on the RSS feed itself in iTunes. Um, how do you do that? How do you grow specifically within a podcast distribution ecosystem like iTunes, for instance? Yeah, so we there are six podcast promotion pillars we work with on Fame Client Shows that are facilitated by Bcast because all Fame Client Shows are hosted on Bcast. Bcast helps. Um, so we can run through those or we can talk about like specifically the thing that's working the best now to get new subscribers on Apple. Fortunately, last month, Apple are finally showing their follower data in, in Podcast Connect. Um, the best thing that works is just literally you go to what you do is go to Facebook ads. You oh, Before you go to Facebook ads, you create like a special subscribe link so you basically take your rss feed and take off https and then you replace that with podcasts and then so you get a special link we can link it below the notes if anyone wants to actually do it yeah um you take that link you then go to facebook ads and then you like obviously get your in in interest targeting right you just put the main the main podcast image single image ad then you would target any ios devices and then the copy can be simple like subscribe to the number one most downloaded marketing podcast podcast image put this link in run that to interest targeting obviously narrowed by like jog fee etc um, demographics and then what that's going to do is send like when you click on that link on an ios device because they're only targeting ios devices that automatically opens apple podcast pops up a little window with a one button to subscribe to the show um it doesn't work like we try this for many clients it doesn't work for all clients but it, does, it really crushes for some obviously based on targeting and messaging so that is like the most direct. It will, you will spend like five, ten dollars per per follower, but that could be worth it for some people. Yeah, um, that's like the most direct way to to do it. So um, let me repeat back there because there was a lot of information there. So you want to have a, a message and ad. So you create an ad that says, "Hey, the Matt Brown Show, whatever you know, whatever your show is, um, subscribe now, right?" And then where do you put that ad? Do you put it on Facebook or LinkedIn as an yeah, example? Yeah, Facebook ads. So okay, and then you target iOS devices. Yeah, you exactly. can also, I, I believe, target iOS devices on LinkedIn and Twitter, but um, we're finding that targeting is better on Facebook. Well, targeting yeah. and cost. Yeah, it, it, the two is yeah. On you, you can't touch Facebook when it comes to targeting and cost. <laughs> like, yeah. first thing Elon Musk needs to do with Twitter is fix the advertising uh, engine on Twitter because it sucks ass. It's mm. shit. You can't even target, uh, like, Cape Town or... Denver, you can't even do that. What kind of ad engine is that? It's rubbish. Mm. I can do like Colorado, but I, like I'm not for the whole of Colorado. Like, come on, man. You know. Uh, and by the way, to your point, if someone's hanging around on an Android device or an iOS device, and I know that's what I want to target, can't do it. Waste of time. 
right? So Facebook targeting, to your point, is great. So you're saying then that you you would see my ad in Facebook, you would link out of Facebook to iTunes or the Apple Podcast app instantly, right? And then you, the show would display and you would subscribe there. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. One other point is, so you do interest targeting based on your audience, and then you would narrow that by people that are interested in podcasts. So we're getting people that are relevant to your business or your show, they're interested in podcasts, and they're on an iOS device. Got you, got you. And um, and you say that that works, say $5 per subscriber. I so mean, like, obviously, that depends on geography and interest. And it like, so sometimes it is more expensive than that. Like, you, you need to yeah. optimize the ad, you need to maybe get lucky with your interests but you can get subscribers or followers as Apple Podcasts call them yeah. for between five and $10. What's the alternative? To, to, to doing that, show? to doing that. Yeah. So if I wanted to get subscribers on my RSS feed and I didn't want to do Facebook advertising, what, what do you recommend to promote your yeah. show? Yeah. So the first thing to do is like the, the like, basic principle of any marketing right is retention is the foundation of growth so just ensure that all of your episodes are improving by like one percent every time that's the first thing but that, you're just asking about promotion not about retention so no. we have six promotion pillars that we can run through if you want to yeah please go for it cool so first is written audio and video seo so if anybody's searching for anything to do with any of your episodes or your show on apple podcast audio google written youtube video then we want to be picked up. And so this is simply getting your tagging right in Buzzsprout or like for both the podcast and for the episodes, getting your tagging right on YouTube when you put the full episode on YouTube, and then also getting your tagging right on the blog post that you're producing for every episode that you put on your domain. So we do this right. We It's not going to get you a shitload of listeners on day one, but over a long time, it should compound as you release every episode. Now, the other thing to do, and I actually think this is the biggest opportunity for podcast growth right now, is that if you Google best marketing podcast or best whatever your niche is, best email open rate podcast, you'll find these blog posts that just random people have done just to get traffic. And they're just lists of top podcasts. Now, these bloggers don't know the value of what they've built. So you can typically go to them and be like, hey, love your list. Um, please, would you add our show in? That might get you like one in 20 now. It's getting harder. But then you can also be like, please add this to your list. We'll back link to you from our domain. Or please add this to your list. We'll give you $100. You'll be surprised at the price of these things. So what I would then do is I go to the top 20 of those blog posts, assuming there's enough in your niche. And I do that for all 20. I'd also then go to Podchaser and you can sign in and create an account. Create one of those lists yourself. Put your show at the top. Um, and then that should rank pretty soon because Podchaser has high rankings. I'd also do that on your own blog as well. So that's, again, like more written SEO to get inbound. So that's pillar one. Okay, go. I'm curious. Keep going. That's great. I love pillar one. Pillar something I'm not doing. So <laughs> I will pillar start two. doing that soon. Um, content syndication. So what other like content assets can we get from this audio or video that we can distribute to social to ideally get engagement and attention? And then we link back to the blog post on our site, which is going to help traffic and SEO. So it's like pulling out snippets, pulling out quotes, pulling out carousels full transcript that goes onto the blog. So we call that content syndication. It's just like leveraging the content you have to maximize its the attention it gets. Amazing. Step three, guest sharing. So how can you get the guest to take a multiple actions to promote the episode? So would the guest link to back to your episode from their press page or from their own blog? Will the guest share on LinkedIn? Will the guest share with their email list? Um, maybe you need to incentivize the guest to do this. That's the number three, and that obviously only works if you have a show with guests on. Number four is partnerships and communities. So who else on the internet has, an, has the attention or uh, are your ideal listeners hanging out where you can get access to them for free? Now, it used to be very easy to do this. Go to Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, Slack groups, Quora, Reddit, but it's getting harder. So now we would typically have to give some time or something else of value in response. So maybe we take the host of your show and then you go and ask to be on another podcast. They have the audience. You get to shout out back to your show at the end, or maybe you just do an episode swap. So it's basically finding out there's pockets of places on the internet where you can get access to without paying. Number five and six are paid. So five is paid social. We just went through one of those strategies, which is the Facebook one we mentioned. There are probably like 10 other places you can do paid promotion for shows on the internet with varying levels of success that we've had. And then six is simply paying 
but again, add on someone else's podcast. So those are the pillars. Yeah, I get a lot of, uh, I'm sure you probably get this as well, uh, Tom, but you get a lot of people who are like, hi, I came across your show of 472 episodes. I represent this guy called Tom Hunt. Uh, I'm not saying this actually happened, <laughs> but they're representing, you know, someone who's trying to PR themselves on audio mediums. I get shit tons of that, so much. Um, and I look at the, I look at them and I'm like, you know, okay, so, but the thing that, that, um, that I don't like about that. It's people who are trying to get free PR. That annoys me because they don't respect the fact that it's been, it didn't, I didn't do, I haven't been doing this for a week. I've been doing it for seven years. So my audience is uh, built through blood, sweat, and lots of tears. Um, and so when someone's coming along to PR the thing, the other thing also, you re for me anyway, the show is like I reached the point now where I don't, I don't need talent. Do you know what I mean? Like I need the best talent in the world. I don't need talent. Like the other day I came, uh, someone came to me and they were like, um, it was a, a, a they're trying to cre recreate, um, I forget what's the name of the thing. It's like a, it's like my mastery or some mastery training program online. Um, and they were like, hey, we'll give you access to our talent. And I'm like, dude, I don't care about your talent. I don't need it. Like they're when they're based here, that you know, not all of them are relevant to my audience. So it would only be business oriented stuff, um, and the and the people that you've got don't really compare to the people that are that have been on the show historically. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it, it stinks a little bit. It's like so if you're going to pitch yourself. That also, the other thing to say is like op, uh, episode swapping. I quite like because it's kind of like, hey, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I don't mind that because there's reciprocity in that. But pure pitching, you know, like, hey, I, I, you know, I built a company f that generated $5 million. Like, who cares, bro? <laughs> like, my audience doesn't care about that. Um, they care about, you know, um, people who are on the cutting edge of, of business thought leadership, business model design, innovation, whatever the case might be. Um, and so... Um, my question to you is, Tom, is how do you suck less at pitching yourself? So, for instance, I've thought about this. I was like, well, maybe I need a PR company in the U.S. You can pitch me on business shows in the U.S., right? Um, but I'm reluctant to do that because it, it would start to smell very much like the stuff that I get pitched on a daily basis. So if you were going to pitch yourself as a founder entrepreneur to raise your brand, your personal brand, or maybe get some PR around your business or whatever the case is, what would you recommend uh, in terms of pitching yourself so that you suck less at actually doing it. <laughs> so you stink less in the process. Yeah, the first thing I'll say is about you hiring a PR agency. I think the only value a PR agency could have is if they have connections. If they have relationships that will get you in the door, that's really what you'd be paying for. If you're just going to pay some like really low level account manager to send out like some poorly written pitch email to 50 podcasts, then you could just hire someone in the Philippines for like $10 an hour to do it for free. Um, so that's my advice to you, Matt. But um, yeah, pitching podcasts. So uh, obviously it was effective for me to get on your show. So what I'm going to share like the exact message. Or actually, before I share the that message, just share the principles. Mm, yeah. So whenever you're trying to convince someone to do anything, you have to understand what they're trying to achieve. So every podcast host typically wants to do two things. They want to create content that's great for their audience, and then they want to grow their audience. And so, but really, as we spoke about before with podcast promotion, it's kind of the same thing. If you create great content for your audience, your show is going to grow. So with that in mind, how are we going to communicate in like 10 seconds that we're going to help them with their goals, help the podcast host with their goals. Um, so with, that, with that, those concepts in mind, let's review the methods that I currently have. Hey, X, uh, you're busy, so be quick. I don't love that line, but it's kind of like busy people like, yeah, you're right, I am busy. And then we say, I heard X's name on your episode because they've actually gone and listened to an episode. So the host is like, okay, this person is not just spamming. He's actually listened to an episode. Are you open to another guest? To make sure it's one of your most downloaded episodes, we will do these three things. You just share it with followers, backlink it, backlink to it from one of our blog posts, spend $50 of our own money on ads, Facebook ads promoting it. Um, so here we're talking directly to the incentive of the host, e.g. they want to grow their show. And then the next section is, if, if that sounds good, here are the topics that I could cover, four bits of things that we think are relevant to the audience of the show. 
Let me know if it makes sense to chat. See, now that doesn't stink. <laughs> That's actually a very good pitch. Like if you came to me and you said, yo, uh, I've got talent and actually we're prepared to promote, work with you to promote them. I mean, to your point, yeah. um, everybody wants to talk about themselves, right? But, you know, if it, if it does come down to a partnership, which is what we're, or, you know, joint venture, if you like, um, you know, it, it's, it's, there's so much one-way traffic. You know, it's like, I need, I need, I need, I need, I want, I want, I want, I want. And you're not actually prepared to like give anything before you receive. It's like Gary literally wrote the book about it, you know, like jab, 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 right hook or whatever it was. Um, but it's the same thing. People like, I, I don't know, I'd, like I don't get it, you know. And, you know, if to, for you to put, let's say on Facebook um, in dollars, $25, like I'm using really small numbers here, you could get thousands of views. Legit, like you spoke, you said it earlier, like targeting and, and, and reach, cost per reach or cost per contact is the cheapest on Facebook. Who knows if it's actually being served to the right people, you know, you know, this Facebook, dodgy. Uh, but, uh, but for something, $100, right? I'm prepared to put $100 on the table or $500 on the table. I want to promote my book, right? I dig your show. I want to activate your audience. I want to generate some content out of this that I can also reshare on my own channels or maybe put onto, uh, you know, my own or promote to my, uh, my newsletter subscribers. Hey man, I, I was on the Matt Brown show and we had a great chat about my book, whatever, Million Dollar Principles, whatever the case might be. But no one's doing that. Like I haven't received a single pitch that even comes close to what you've described. The best example I have of this is Russell Brunson was spent like a decade trying to get Tony Robbins to promote his stuff. And after 10 years, the way he did it is he was launching one of the books. Can't remember which one expert secrets, I think. And he says, to Tony, look, can you interview me on your Facebook page? We'll do a Facebook live. And you like, I'm going to, you give me access to your ad account. I'm going to put my credit card in there. My team are going to set up the ads and we're going to run a shitload of ads to that interview. And obviously they're pitching the, the book funnel and in the book funnel, for every book that sold, I think he was giving $25 in affiliate commission, which is more than the cost of the book. So Russell was putting his ad spend to promote the interview. And then for every book that was sold, he would pay Tony the, the affiliate commission. So Russell probably spent like millions of dollars on that, but it blew his business up. So it's really about like trying to understand incentives. That for Tony was a complete no-brainer. Um, and then like delivering on the thing that you promised and then building mm. the relationship from there. That's very interesting, right? It's a very interesting real world example that um, because it, I call it like a grand slam offer. You, you, it's an offer so good, you'd be stupid to say no. And most people suck at pitching stuff. They suck at pitching themselves. They don't know how to package what the value of what they do. They don't know how to frame their, scarc their scarcity and dictate their value. They don't have a network. There's so many things that they don't have. But what they do have is a brain. And if you think, if you can think through, what does this person want? And then what do I want? Right, so how do we now create a mutually beneficial partnership? Like I love that Russell Bronson story because also, by the way, to have Tony Robbins interview you, you like, you done. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you yeah. done, dude, because every time someone searches, you know, Tony Robbins, whatever, self-help, like they're going to come across this content, right? So the other thing that you also know is that, and I'm sure you agree, is that content lives forever. You know, so it, it may have been a partnership now, but who knows how long you could run that thing for if it's working, right? If you're making money, I'm making money, everyone's winning, right? Yeah. Quickly, I want to change gears. So um, there's some rad stuff on, I know I'm focusing on BCAST, so I, <laughs> I haven't been talking about fame too much. Um, but I like these growth features, audio inserts, uh, auto opt-in, uh, email opt-in, audio messages, uh, integrated affiliate, guest notifications, uh, headline integration, stuff like that. Can you walk us through what are your favorite growth features? Like if someone was listening to us right now with a podcast, they're like, yo, I want to get my 10% growth every month. Uh, I want some growth features. What what should they be looking at uh, on uh, Yeah, so I think the, the simple ones are like publish to YouTube and 
transcription. So that helps with the contents indication pillar. So you can, in like two clicks, publish the full audio and like a YouTube optimized image. This is if you're not recording full video, or even if you are, this is much easier. We'll just publish to your YouTube playlist. Uh, transcription is obviously transcribing to so you can put that onto the blog post to improve with pillar one audio uh, audio SEO. Um, other ones to build growth. My Probably my favorite Bcast feature. Well, you know, so one more on growth. Only released last week, episode title split testing. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure Buff Brown doesn't have that. But you can essentially just pick two episode titles, split test them for 48 hours, um, and then Bcast will choose the one that got the most downloads. So that is no, literally no other podcast host has that for sure. Um, probably my favorite feature, though, is it's more on the ROI side. So let's go back to the example. We're doing a B2B show, and... We have done six months. We got some interest, some like sales conversations, partnership conversations with guests, getting a couple of thousand downloads a month. Now the obvious like question is how are we going to start building out an ROI from the listener side? So the answer here is what we call audio inserts. So what you would do is let's say you had a webinar, let's say you had an offer, let's say you had a something special that you, to move these people from the next stage into the next stage of your funnel, which is typically getting the email address. We would record like a 30 second audio of the host reading out the CTA. Mm -hmm. Then with audio inserts, you can just go back and put that audio into the start, end or middle of every episode in a few clicks. Um, and just run that for the next 10 days before the webinar, for example. Um, so that helps transition or helps you build up the ROI on the listener side once you have the audience. Very, very cool. So I've already told uh, my producer Maverick, we need to move off Buzzsprout, he's gonna freak out. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm keen I to... I can help with the transition, personally. No, <clears throat> oh, it's all good, man. Um, yeah, he's busy messaging me now. So he's crying. But he must work for his money. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's only been seven years. <laughs> but that's cool. So listen, uh, cognizance of time, Tom. Um, let's uh, maybe wrap this up. Um, why does this subject of podcasting matter to you so much? Yeah, it's... I don't think it's just podcasting. I think what I love is I really love understanding and influencing people in like a good way because the influence is to change behavior and it can be used like negatively, which may be called like manipulation, but can also be to influence people in a good way. And so I, I, don't, I think I have a really like significant interest in like business and entrepreneurship. And then I also have this interest in like influencing people for a good way and like psychology. And so the reason why, like, so that would obviously push me into like influence and marketing. And then the, I think I just always love like listening to podcasts. I had my own podcast 2016 um, that became more successful than the business that it was supposed to promote. Um, so I think I love the audio like world. And then I love business and I also love influencing people and marketing. So you bring them together and that's what you get. Awesome stuff. Tom, uh, thank you so much for being with, uh, with me on the show, man. It's been great to uh, talk to someone who knows more than I do about podcasting. So thank you very, very much. It's been uh, enlightening for me. Uh, guys, uh, check it out. It is, uh, well, in fact, why don't you do the honors there? Um, Tom, <laughs> bcast.fm, fame.so, yeah. anywhere else. Yeah, that's else? it. And then I have a show where I just, it's like B2B marketing focus, where I pretty much just share everything we're doing to grow fame and bcast it's called confessions of a b2b marketer you can find that on podcast apps there you go cool i'll be checking that out uh tom once again thank you so much thanks for all of you uh, online maverick lots of work for you to do now um we will see <laughs> <laughs> we will see you all again soon cheers Good night.